Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank the organizers of uh, uh, this conference for inviting me to this uh, special symposium. In this talk, I'd like to uh, share with you a theory which was proposed a decade ago and uh, developed uh, since then. And this theory aims to link with, uh, between physiology and behavior. And the plan was, uh, is first to propose, uh, pose some uh, motivation questions, and then the theory is proposed in response to these questions. Two predictions of the theory are shown, and there are experimental tests, and then we discuss some implications. The first question is, what is V1 doing? So you may wonder, don't we already know this? V1 detects edges and bars. Now let's reflect on this a little bit from past research. This is the brain, and this is when it's unfolded in the, in the monkey. Here are the two retinas. This is V1, next is V2. This blue patch is V4. This tiny brownish patch is NT. And we notice that V1 is much bigger than many other areas. In 1953, Stephen Kufler found that ganglion cells in retina detect center surround features, and they are therefore called feature detectors. Two junior researchers in his lab, Hugo and Wiesel, decided to follow the same <coughs> line of thinking. They tried to say, what will be the feature detectors in V1? And they found there are bars and edges. So we noticed that from retina to V1, the feature advanced from dot to bars. Well, if you think along the line, you think perhaps next it should be triangles, squares, circles, and faces. Well, it takes uh, it took about ten years for Hugo Weasel to do their beautiful work. However, many more ten years have passed. Somehow, the success is not as easy in the higher visual areas. It invites us to pause and think, why in this case? Perhaps something changed. Feature detection theory or feature detecting line of thinking may not be applicable anymore. And then let's reflect. What is exactly changed? What is V1 doing? We thought it was detecting edges and bars. But for what reason? Perhaps to prepare information for later? Perhaps to verify whatever we have seen, for instance, we see a face, we like to verify, is it really in the input that I saw a face? However, this way of thinking is like saying V1 is only playing a back, back office role. But V1 is really huge. You might think it consumes a lot of blood, maybe you know, it should be doing something more important. So what is this more important task? This motivates to the second motivation question, which brain areas control the direction of attention? Well, attention is important because let's review how information flow in our visual system. <coughs> First, raw information comes in at about 25 frames a second, which is many megabytes per second. Many megabytes is like many books. That's a lot. This is then compressed. You can always zip your data yeah, before you're sending out to, uh, by email. This is then compressed by center sonorous field, which is to reduce redundancy, and this will compress to about one book of amount of information, about one megabyte. One megabyte is still too much. You cannot read one whole book in a second. Our attentional bottleneck can only read about two sentences per second. Therefore, we have to delete most of the sentences before we even read it. Now, how do we decide which two sentences to read before we even delete it? Here is a demonstration that information is indeed deleted. Can you see the difference between these two images? If you haven't deleted any information, you should spot the difference right away, but most of you cannot. We are therefore blind to almost everything except the tiny bit that we pay attention to. This is formalized in this diagram. Raw information is encoded, and then it is selected only a tiny bit to go through the information attentional bottleneck before it reaches perception. So attention has to be guided somehow to select these two sentences. It can be guided by two ways. One is bottleneck saliency, 
bottom-up exogenous attention, the other is top-down factors. For example, the two tongues for the, for the monster, the tongue of the monster is very salient. We can see whether they are different in these two images. They can guide your attention automatically, and you see there's no difference between the two tongues in these two images. Another way is to guide by top-down factors. If I say, look to the lower middle of the image, then you see, oh, is that different in these two images? They are indeed different. So for instance, here versus there. So here I'm directing your information in a top-down manner. Well, since whatever we do not direct our gaze to is deleted, it's very important to select correctly. So how is this information selected? So which brain area does this important task to, to direct your attention to these two centers before deleting everything, while deleting everything else? Well, V1 is looking for a role for something to do. And here, we do have an important job opening. So let me propose that a saliency map is created in V1 to guide this attention exogenously in a bottom-up manner. Saliency map really is a, a psychological concept. Each visual input gives a saliency map. For example, with this retina input, your attention is automatically directed to the vertical bar. I do not need to tell you to look there, you already see it. This is as if there is a hotspot in a saliency map to guide your attention. The effect of this hotspot can be measured behaviorally by how short the reaction time is to find this vertical bar. I propose that this saliency map is the map of the one neural firing rates. In particular, the highest response to each visual location represents the saliency of this location. This map is perhaps read out by the superior curriculus, which receives monosynaptic inputs from V1 and directs eye movement. Accordingly, neural activities are the universal currency to bid for visual selection. The receptive field of the most active V1 neuron is selected. This hypothesis focuses only on the bottom-up guidance of attention. We should be able to measure or observe this bottom-up saliency in experiment designed to make top-down factors negligible. This is a reductionist approach. And I'll see why it works and how it actually works. And therefore, by now, if I say saliency, I actually mean bottom-up saliency only. This theory is against the traditional wisdom which presumed that higher cortical areas guide the attentional selection, even when attention is guided by bottom-up factors. Now this, uh, this presumption is actually motivated by the observation that saliency is feature unspecific. For instance, in this, this location, it, a location can be salient due to its unique orientation as in this retinal input, but it can also be due to, due to its unique color or due to its unique motion of direction. In this example, there's one moving to the right among most moving to the right, uh, moving to the left. Therefore, saliency is a general purpose thing. It's feature unspecific. Different features have to be combined to make a general feature unspecific saliency map. And this combined map should therefore in higher cortical areas where neurons are not tuned to specific features. In contrast, Neurons in V1 are tuned to specific orientation, or specific color, specific motion direction, etc. Therefore, V1 could not have the saliency map according to these traditional views. So now let's try to think outside the box of the traditional views using a metaphor. Here's the metaphor using an auction sh uh, shop metaphor. This auction shop has a slogan. It says, attention option here, no discrimination between your feature preferences, only spike count. Auctioneer may be superior curriculus. Its neurons are not tuned to features, therefore it's feature blind. But it can still count the spikes. There are three V1 neurons bidding for the attention. One is tuned to rightward motion, bidding one spike of money. One tuned to red color, building three spikes of money. One tuned to tilted orientation, bidding two spikes of money. The auctioneer takes the highest bid, regardless of, of the bidder's feature preference, or their age, or
or their gender or their religious belief. Hence, even though V1 neurons are feature-tuned, V1's firing rates could serve the purpose of a saliency map. One may wonder whether retina could also serve as the saliency map, since retina also projects to the superior colliculus. Here is the superior colliculus. You can see the retina projects directly to it. So does V1. However, at least in monkeys, V1 lesion eliminates visually guided eye movements until at least two months after surgery recovery. Hence, retinal activities cannot serve saliency, at least in normal conditions. So now let's ask, what could be the neural mechanism that actually computes saliency from raw input contrast? These mechanisms are actually intracortical interactions. So what are they? This is the V1 cortical surface in retinal coordinates. The surface is color-coded by the preferred orientation of the underlying neurons. For example, vertical orientation preference is color-coded by the blue color. The unique vertical bar evokes a response for a, from, a vertically, uh, from a neuron tuned to vertical orientation. The background horizontal bars evoke responses from neurons tuned to horizontal orientation. However, neighboring V1 neurons interact with each other by recurrent connections. Here is a V1 neuron with its processes extending to neighboring cortical locations in order to link to neighboring V1 neurons for these intracortical interactions. This, action, this interaction is like-to-like -like and largely suppressive, such that neighboring neurons tune to the same feature, for instance, tune to the same orientation, tune to the same color, or tuned to the same motion direction, they tend to suppress each other. However, if they are not tuned to the same feature, they are less likely to suppress each other. This is called isofeature suppression. So an example of it is isoorientation suppression, which is studied much more extensively. The horizontal input bars evoke responses from neurons tuned to horizontal orientation. They suppress each other by these isoorientation suppression. The vertical bar is the only one that evoke response in this vertical tuned neuron, and uh, um, it escapes this isoorientation suppression, therefore its response is the highest, making this uh, response map the, uh, the hotspot in this response map. And um, in this uh, second input, when all neurons, all bars are vertical, then they all suppress each other because all neurons experience isoorientation suppression. All the responses are <laughs> suppressed. No bar is salient. When there is no background bars, the response to the single vertical bar is not suppressed because the neighboring suppressors are not activated. Hugo and Weasel used mostly a single bar in their visual display, hence they did not observe the contextual influence of the neurons, neural responses. However, these contextual influences have been observed ever since the 1970s, even though uh, their computational role was not known until quite recently. And our intuition has been verified by a V1 model simulating these intracortical interactions. Therefore, if you give this uh, you know, input, it will give you the highest response to, iso, uh, orientation sing to the orientation singleton. It can also highlight uh, borders to simple textures or border to complex textures or even highlight contours uh, in, in, uh, among noises and so on. Now, let's uh, look at the predictions from this theory and their experimental test. The first prediction I'd like to show is quite surprising, and it's a qualitative prediction. We all know that salient input are usually quite distinctive perceptually. For instance, these are two examples. A unique color can be very salient, it's distinct by a unique color, or unique orientation can be salient. However, if I show you this array of seemingly identical horizontal bars, None of them is perceptually distinctive, but if I tell you that one of them is very salient, it's going to capture your attention, even capture your gaze shift, and just like the orientation, uh, just like the color singleton or orientation singleton, this must seem very surprising. However, this is actually a prediction of the V1 theory. The uniqueness of this feature is invisible to you, but it's visible to V1. It's unique because it's uniquely presented to a different eye. It's uniquely presented to the left, right eye, and all other bars are presented to the left eye. 
it's visible only to V1 because only V1 has monocular neurons. V2 and uh, uh, higher visual areas mainly only have uh, binocular neurons. Therefore, the activities of these higher visual areas cannot distinguish the eye of origin of neural inputs, uh, of the visual inputs. Perceptual blindness to the eye of origin feature has been known. For example, Jeremy Wolf and colleagues showed in 1988 that observers cannot report a visual search target defined only by its unique eye of origin. So now you may ask, if the observers cannot even report it, how are you to test attentional capture by the CF singleton? We can test it by this single by making the singleton task irrelevant as a non-target bar in a visual search task for an orientation singleton. The eye of origin singleton is not distinctive, but predicted to be salient. The orientation singleton is the visual search target. It is highly distinctive and is known to be salient. If the eye of origin singleton is salient enough, it should compete for attention and therefore distract attention from the search target and therefore interfere with the task. This prediction is indeed confirmed. The reaction time in finding the orientation singleton target is prolonged. This is because, as you can verify by eye tracking, the initial gaze shift during the search is directed to the task irrelevant eye of origin singleton, three times as likely as it is directed to the search target. Therefore, this observation suggests that eye of origin singleton is much more salient than orientation single to itself. As mentioned, V1 can see the eye of origin feature, but higher visual areas cannot. Therefore, the salience of the eye of origin singleton is not the result of top-down feedback or any other perceptual awareness of it. It is a fingerprint for V1. This is therefore a dissociation between perceptual distinction and bottom-up saliency to attract attention. I will skip some other qualitative predictions. Some of them uh, are also tested and confirmed, including some fMRI data. And I go directly to a next prediction from the uh, uh, theory. And this prediction is quantitative. It's predicting reaction times in about tasks. And before I actually show you this prediction, let me show you some other examples of quantitative predictions from other theories and models. Laughlin predicted in 1978 contrary response function of neurons in fly's compound eye. The whole curve is predicted without a single parameter and uh, uh, from the efficient coding theory and the prediction agrees with data. Attic and Redick predicted co human contrast sensitivity functions at various light levels. A few parameters were used for these predictions. Zalping, Geisler and May predicted thresholds in wavelength discrimination functions um, discrimination task, discrimination, not this way function. And they used the maximum likelihood decoding uh, theory. A single parameter was used to predict this whole curve. And we like to see whether we can predict also some curve from this saliency theory without any parameters. And this work is done with a graduate student, B2. First, let's recall that according to the theory, saliency at a location is determined by the maximum response to this location, regardless of the feature preference of the responding neuron. For instance, at the location of the red bar, a neuron to, to the red color should be responding very highly because it escapes the isocolor suppression, which is suppressing on the background uh, responses to the background bars. They are all responding to blue color. Blue color tuned bars are suppressed. Meanwhile, another neuron, which may be tuned to horizontal orientation, is also responding to this bar. This neuron's response will be suppressed because other horizontally tuned neurons responding to the background, background bars will be suppressing it. Saliency to, uh, at this location is determined by the maximum response, and this response comes from the color tuned neuron. The saliency is not determined from the summation of response of the color tuned neuron and orientation tuned neuron, because the auctioneer in the superior cuticles is not so clever to add it up. And um, even though at one location you may have multiple neurons responding to the same location, only the maximum response, the highest bidder's response, determines signals. 
So now let's apply this to our prediction. To derive prediction, let's first use a toy V1 model. In this toy V1 model, I only have two kinds of cells. One is tuned to color, one kind of cell tuned to color, another kind of tuned to uh, orientation. In this top image, a red or a color singleton is there, and let's call it C singleton. C stands for color. And let's say observer can find the singleton by 500 milliseconds because it pops up very quickly. And uh, this, let's say, is caused by a color neuron responding 10 spikes per second. And this conversion from five, uh, 10 spikes per second to 500 milliseconds is done by the saliency readout system. And the conversion curve will give you a shorter RT uh, from a, a higher firing rate. And this is simply the definition of saliency. The exact curve of this conversion curve is unimportant as long as it's monotonically decreasing. In the middle image, there is an orientation singleton, and let's call it O singleton. Let's say that reaction time to find this singleton is now RTO equal to 600 millisecond, and because an orientation to a neuron is now responding to it, nine spike per second, less response, higher uh, IT, longer RT. In the bottom image, the singleton is unique in both color and orientation. Let's call it CO singleton. What should be the reaction time to find it according to our theory? Anybody? 500? 600? 400? 500, okay. Yes, indeed. It should be 500 according to the theory. This is because the orientation to a neuron is responding 9 spikes per second. The color to a neuron is responding 10 spikes per second. The maximum response is 10 spikes per second. You don't add it up, it becomes 19 spikes per second. So 10 spikes per second, which is 500 by the conversion table, so 500 milliseconds. So we have just reached a quantitative prediction without any parameters. The nine spikes and 10 spikes, they are not parameters, they are just my illustration example. Basically from the two reaction time, 500, 600, you predict 500 without a single parameter. Of course, V1 response are stochastic, so therefore RT data is probabilistic. So therefore if you have 10 spike response, you may get 500 millisecond. If you have 12 spike response, you may have 400 response. Uh, millisecond uh, reaction time, and therefore you can actually have a whole histogram of reaction times. Now, therefore we can predict a whole histogram of reaction time from, for this uh, double feature singleton. So let's say if you have orientation feature singleton, and you get a whole histogram of uh, responses, therefore a whole histogram of uh, reaction time. If you have a color singleton, now the most active responding neuron will be turned to color, it gives you another sequence uh, histogram of response values and another histogram of uh, ration time for the color singleton, for <coughs> color singleton. Now if you have double feature singleton, two types of neurons responding to it. One is orientation tuned, one is color tuned, and let's say these are the responses. Then you take its maximum, the maximum to, among the two responses in each trial, and this maximum response goes to the conversion table, you'll get your whole, uh, whole curve of reaction times. So therefore, you can get this whole curve reaction time. Now, do we need these numbers? Actually, we don't. From these two curves, you can get this curve. How do you do that? Randomly sample a reaction time from this distribution. Randomly sample another reaction time from this distribution. Take the minimum of these two samples. It will be a sample in this distribution. You repeat this many, many times. You get many, many samples. Get the whole curve out without any parameters. So let's see, can we compared with uh, experimental data, and this data was corrected with my postdoc as the cone, and we have three different singletons, orientation, color, and double feature, and there's 300 trials per condition, or different conditions are interleased. And this is uh, showing two ration time distributions for the color singleton, one is for orientation singleton for a particular subject. From these, let's predict the ration time and this blue curve is predicted reaction time for the double feature singleton, and the red curve is observed uh, distribution. Now, you notice that looks like the predicted one reaction time is longer than the observed one. Are they statistically different from each other? Yes, they are, unfortunately. We have a p-value almost zero. The theoretical prediction is wrong because we use the toy V1, not the real V1. In real V1, we have neurons tuned conjectively simultaneously to both color and orientation. So therefore, if we start 
with the RT distributions for the single feature singletons. When you have the double feature singleton, this conjunctive neuron is also more vigorously activated. The saliency of this CO singleton is determined by the maximum response from three kinds of neurons, the O cell, the C cells, and the CO cell. When the CO cell has the highest response, the RT is shorter than you predicted, shorter than the minimum RT from the two single uh, feature singletons. And therefore, you cannot predict the reaction time. You, all you can know is this is shorter than whatever you predict. Shorter by how much, you cannot predict. So what can we predict instead? Well, we know that we failed to do this because we will actually do have these CO singletons. So we cannot predict quantitatively. All we can predict is qualitatively. However, in V1, we have neuron tuned to color, orientation, and motion direction. We have some neuron tuned conjunctively to color and orientation, some other neuron tuned to motion direction and orientation. But so far, despite looking for them, few neurons are tuned conjunctively to color and motion direction. Therefore, we can reasonably assume that the one has no neurons tuned to the triple conjunction, color, motion, and orientation, CMO. Because of this, you can derive this equation, which is analogous of that equation in our toy V1. Again, just like our toy V1 situation, there is no single parameter in this equation. Therefore, you can predict the probability distribution of the reaction time to the triple uh, feature singleton from the reaction time of the other feature singletons. And if this prediction is confirmed, extra strike cortical uh, cortex plays no role in CAC because according to my colleague Stuart Stuart Ship in UCL, V2 does have CMO neurons, and therefore V2 would give you this failed prediction, uh, give you this, therefore you cannot predict quantity. Now let's uh, take the same data, now the data actually coming from seven type of single uh, terms, single features, three double feature, and one triple feature. This is from a particular subject, again, 300 trials per condition. This is three single feature, this is three double feature, and now we can use this equation to predict the reaction time for the triple feature. The blue curve is the predicted distribution, and the red curve is uh, uh, from the observed distribution, and they are indifferent from each other. And this is a report from, from this observer, and we have altogether six observers, and for all of them, p-value is larger than 0 0.1, and the biggest difference from this, this subject, but this difference, even this difference is insignificant. And therefore, we have this uh, um, V1 theory, and we subjected this row, and two points predictions confirms, and let's have a quick look for the implications uh, of this theory. Now let's recall that we had problems uh, uh, with our investigation. Um, they are not as successful as Hugo Weaver's in investigation in V1. And that motivates us, what is V1 doing? Now if V1 is indeed to, to the bottom up uh, uh, selection, this should motivate us to think the role of V2 and V3. We think V2, V3, V4, they should do something in light of what V1 has done. So therefore, the information reaching the extras and cortex perhaps have already been through some degree of bottom-up selection. No wonder passive feature detectors in higher areas are hard to find, because a lot of information has been already filtered, if that's the case. We can perhaps pull V2 and higher visual areas for their role in top-down selection and in post-selectional decoding. In both cases, we should uh, expect many task-dependent factors. This is already seen in many investigations. And in addition, bottom-up salience signals seen in higher visual areas, such as LIP and FEF, they may not be created there, but inherited from V1. Thank you very much for your attention. presentation. So, are there questions? Uh, if you have questions, please use preferably the microphones in the center, Kale, and uh, we also have one of our students running around. Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, some of these conjunction searches must have been really hard. Are they consistent with bottom up pop-up? Uh, in fact, that is true. Uh, conjunction search is harder if you don't have conjunction cells. 
Even though color orientation congestion search is hard, they are not as hard than the yeah, they are not as hard than orientation orientation conjunction searches because in B1 there is no single cell turned to conjunction of two orientations. So yes, uh, that, that that is true. But I can tell you more details. We actually investigate another paper. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hi, very nice talk. Um, it's not clear to me why you don't postulate top-down processing in B1, given that there's plenty of evidence from neurophysiology and fMRI studies of such modulation. Um, first of all, data suggested that there's no role, uh, but this data is only for feature singletons. Now, what if you have something less salient? In such a case, maybe there are top-down factors. So you can see a lot of my data are uh, using very salient things. So let's imagine Superior Calicus is a committee chair, is trying to decide where to direct attention, and you have a committee member which is V1, V2, V3, V4. Some of them are more impulsive, like V1, making lots of mistakes, but very quick. And other of them may be uh, very slow, but they are more careful, and so on. And in uh, urgent and quick situations, maybe the committee chair just decides not to wait for uh, you know, the slow members, and they make a decision and do uh, you know, impulsive, reflexive, uh, uh, eye movements. So I cannot rule out the role of uh, higher areas in less serious situation. Well, in such a case, you already have a gist of the scene. I, I'm not sure whether it's no longer, it, whether it's uh, solely bottom up, perhaps uh, 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 top down areas. So for instance, when you see a kitchen, you say, hmm, here's a kitchen. And there, if you're looking for a kettle, you will direct your gaze to the counter. That is already top down factor uh, coming in. Uh, thanks for the very nice talk. Um, what do you think is the role of the V1, V1 bypassing projections to the extrastroid areas for the, such a setting? Bypassing? Scenario? Yeah, yeah, the, like the LGN MT direct connection or the LGN V4. Oh, it is not but bypassing. I am not completely understanding because V1 uh, is projecting to V2 and superior. So let me go, go, to, go to this uh, anatomy. You can see that. Um, no, I'm, I'm just, I mean, these projections exist, I'm just asking, what do you think is the, the role in, in, in such a saliency map model? Uh, the saliency map is projected to, directly to the superior clickers. It's already uh, doing its uh, reflexive gaze movement. It does not need V2 and V3 to do that. So therefore, if you, uh, I, I haven't done this exam myself, if, if, if you remove all cortical areas beyond V1, uh, this animal will behave like a frog will just stick its tongue out without recognizing the fly. Of course, the frog doesn't even have, have a people. So therefore, this theory does not apply to frog. But in that case, the superior cliffs of the frog just directly take from the retina and do it. So you would say that, uh, something like blindside would take place purely subcortical and doesn't evolve any? Most blindside studies are after the recovery of the patients. As I said, in monkeys, after two months of recovery, monkeys do make, after B1 lesion, they do make eye movement too to visual targets, but within this two months they cannot do that. So most blind side patients are studied after at least one year of recovery, and I suspect they either uh, revert back to their evolutionary ancestors directly using V1's input to superior curriculums, or LGN projections to higher extracortical areas, which then also project to superior curriculums. Maybe they take over, but I do not know. Thanks. I think we can take uh, one more question while Felix is already setting up his laptop on the stage. Okay, again, thank you very much for a wonderful yep. talk. Do you think there's any role for spatial frequency in this? Perhaps there is. Unfortunately, I haven't uh, measured myself, but I think lots of uh, data reviewed by uh, Jamie Wolf gave very nice reviews of the visual search things using various features, and I think uh, spatial frequency is one of those features. People disagree or discuss about some features are more basic than others, so maybe spatial frequency is one of the basic features, but not as strong as, let's say, color orientation and motion direction. And in this case, eye of origin is even more basic than spatial feature. Uh, spatial. Thank you.